Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, the 22nd meeting this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to agenda item one, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices, uh, except uh, people like clerks and uh, witnesses who may use um, uh, digital devices uh, for the benefit of their contribution, specifically in the business today. We have apologies from Cara Hilton. Uh, but agenda item one today is the Scottish Government's designation of marine protected areas. And this item will allow the committee to take evidence from stakeholders in a roundtable format on the government's designations. Now, the sound is uh, dealt with automatically for those of you who don't know, so you don't need to press any buttons. Um, it will be noticed if you wish to identify yourself to speak, stick your hand up and we'll put you on the list. We'll try and bring in as many people as possible. Um, I'll ask people to introduce themselves in a minute, but I'd like to say that, unfortunately, Professor Lawrence Mee, the director of SAMS and the UHI, has been taken uh, very badly ill and will not be here today. And we have sent our uh, condolences. We only found this information yesterday. And um, we're sorry that he's not able to take part, as that's an important uh, element in the discussions from a scientific point of view. So if we can go round the table and introduce ourselves, starting with Lloyd Austin, who can tell you who he is. <laughs> um, thank you, Convener. As you say, I'm Lloyd Austin. I'm Head of Conservation Policy for RSBB in Scotland. I'm Nigel, <coughs> I'm Nigel Don, MSP for Angus North and Demons. Um, Professor Bob Furness, I retired about three years ago from Glasgow University, although I'm listed as Glasgow University on the paper. Uh, I now work for MacArthur Green Environmental Consultancy, and I'm also a member of the board of SNH. I'm Claudia Beamish, and I'm South Scotland MSP and Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, I'm uh, Mike Tetley, uh, representing Will and Dolphin Conservation, and also a new IUCN Task Force on Marine Mammal Protected Areas. Uh, Dave Thompson, MSP for Skylark Arbor and Bainnock. Uh, morning, convener. Morning, everybody. I'm Mick Borwell. I'm the Environment Director with Oil & Gas UK. We are the representative body for the upstream oil and gas industry in the UK. We represent 460 companies, including operators and supply chain. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Callum Duncan, Scotland Programme Manager for the Marine Conservation Society and convener of Scottish Environment Links Marine Task Force. Um, good morning, Alex Ferguson, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. Hey, good morning, uh, I'm Jenny Hogan, I'm the Director of Policy at Scottish Renewables. Uh, morning also, Jim Hume, MSP for South Scotland. I'm Phil Hammond from the University of St Andrews, attached to the Sea Mammal Research Unit. Good morning, I'm Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. I'm Ross Dougal, Vice President of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation. Yeah, good morning. I'm Graeme Day. I'm the MSP for Angus South and the Deputy Convener of the Committee. Hello, everybody. I'm Rob Gibson, MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, and the Convener of the Committee. And I'm going to kick off this morning thinking about the way in which the MPAs have been selected and designated that process, particularly um, if uh, stakeholders are content with the selection and designation process and the timing of the implementation of the MPA network. So would anyone like to kick off with that, please? If you just indicate, Jenny Hogan. Um, well, first of all, I would say that Scottish Renewables um, continues to support the development of um, an ecologically coherent network of marine protected areas. Um, so it's a, a positive um, process as far as we're concerned. Um, we have had some concerns with the way it's been developed, but um, I think I'd rather focus my comments today on, on where we go from here. Um, but more in terms of the timing, um, I would say that um, well, offshore renewable energy is at a critical uh, stage of its development right now. Um, we've got some serious um, issues facing the industry around electricity market reform. Um, we're looking at you know, very um, competitive allocation rounds that we're now going to be going into there with very limited budget, much lower than we expected. There's still a huge drive towards cost reduction for the sector. 
Um, and we in tidal technologies in particular still have some major uh, technological um, challenges ahead. So given that, um, the timing of the process we feel is, is unfortunate um, with all those various pressures um, facing us. Um, and we have some remaining concerns around the next steps um, of the process, um, which I'm happy to go into now, or if you'd rather come to that. I think we answer. might began, begin to find that out as we ask more detailed sure. questions. But you said how the process was uh, evolved. Mm -hmm. You better give us a short idea well, of I mean, what you meant. I think it's uh, important to say that the industry, along with um, most of the other stakeholders, have had um, a great deal of input and discussion throughout the process. So um, in that respect, we, we've been um, pleased with it. Um, I think in terms of the decisions, um, the main area of concern that, that we had was around the first, the fourth uh, banks complex. Um, I think we'd highlighted in our consultation response that there were other sites that we felt were similar and that could have been chosen instead of. So we were disappointed to see that that, that decision had been made and that those other sites were actually uh, designated in addition to the first, fourth uh, banks complex, so that's the main the main concern that we've had with the, the decision okay. that's been made. But thank you, Jenny. That's right. uh, Mick Borwell. Uh, we also continue to support the uh, uh, the MPA process. The consultation process towards designation we were very pleased with. It, it was very good. Um, we're also pleased that the en almost the entirety of the network was presented to us in one go, um, rather than in tranches that has been done. Um, elsewhere, which makes the level of uncertainty um, greater. Um, on the designation themselves, the issue for us is that possibly because much of the evidence base has come from oil and gas surveys of the seabed, the MPAs are placed around oil and gas current activities. And we have something like 5% of the UK oil and gas production within the Scottish MPAs. Um, we have challenges to, to come, so we'll talk about those at the appropriate point. Okay. I mean, obviously, the issue about um, the network's coherence and so on is something which no doubt people will uh, dwell on. Lloyd Austin? Yeah, thank you, Kavina. Um, we uh, very much welcome the move towards uh, designating a network of ecological coherent protected areas. We uh, welcome the announcement. We, like some of the previous speakers, we uh, felt that the consultation and the involvement and discussion process was comprehensive. Um, we see the announcement as a first step um, because, as you've suggested, there's more to do in terms of deciding the management, but there's equally more to do in terms of uh, ensuring that the full range of features are represented in the network. We'll probably come back to that. Um, I think um, the key part of the process for us might be uh, some of the descriptions of the of the criteria that have been used in terms of the exclusion of mobile species and seabirds from the MPA selection process. So that is, I think, the the process point that uh, gave us some concern um, in terms of. A network, I think it's important to recognise that a network must include both the internationally and the nationally important sites. So I think it was a positive move from the Cabinet Secretary to announce the draft SPAs at the same time as the MPAs um, so that the network as a whole could be seen. Um, of course, we think that there's further steps to go, but that's another part of the process that was positive. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to broaden this out at the moment because we have to set context that, um, just as the RSPB has said, um, particular s species of uh, seabird have shown sustained declines since 1986 when these were measured, not just in the last four years since Marine Scotland was created. Um, so getting that in context uh, and thinking about the process and the timing, do you think these factors have been taken on board. Was Bob Furness going to say something there? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> different seabirds have seen different trajectories. Some of our seabirds have declined very dramatically. And Arctic skiwa has gone straight from the green list to the red list because of a decline of more than 50%. 
On the other hand, gannets are still increasing. So there are different pressures on different species. But uh, clearly, Scotland has internationally important populations of seabirds. We, we have something like one third of all of the seabirds in the European Union nesting around Scotland. And several of our seabird species are, are predominantly found in Scottish waters. So they're very important to us as, as a, um, a feature of the natural environment. And I think it's absolutely essential that we consider the SPA provision alongside MPAs, because while MPAs only give protection to black guillemots among seabirds, uh, SPAs, which are yet to, to come through the system, are intended to provide protection for foraging areas of some species. And I think that is crucial and, and something that we do need to, to progress. Uh, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Just to develop that point about black guillemots, I was struck by um, the fact that we've got, what, four proposed MPAs that are specific to black guillemots. Are they under such threat that that's required? Um, black guillemots are doing moderately well compared with some other species, so they're not the most threatened of our seabirds. But they are at risk. For example, they nest under boulders on beaches, and they're at risk from mink predation and from other mammals. Um, they're quite subject to human disturbance. Uh, they're very inshore seabirds, so they're rather different from the, the seabirds that are predominantly way out at sea. Um, and so the, um, the, reason, the reason that black guillemots are included within the MPA suite is um, because they are not included in SPA features because they don't migrate. And they're our only seabird that does not migrate. So all of our other seabirds are, to some extent, protected by SPAs as migratory species. Black guillemots are not. Thank you for that. Um, uh, others may want to, to come in. Uh, I was just going to point out that Sam's suggested that there's clear evidence of degradation of marine habitats, though its severity varies from place to place providing good opportunities for conservation. That phrase, I think, uh, homes in on some of the particulars that we need to be looking at uh, with urgency in the MPAs. And I wondered if uh, you thought, as I said, about the selection, designation and timing, that uh, these uh, particular ones, apart from what Lloyd Austin has uh, pointed out, you know, particularly about seabirds, had been taken account of. Callum Duncan. Um, thank, thank you, convener. Um, I mean, in terms of timing, <clears throat> you know, protection for our marine environment is 40, 50 years behind terrestrial environments. And I think um, we would concur with what Sam's are saying about the denuded baseline that we're working from. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we'd ever be in a position where developers of all kinds would have the, de the degree of certainty that would enable um, uh, you know, everybody to be absolutely content right off, right off the front. I mean, I would just say that we support the process that arrived at the sites. Um, we think the right decision was made to, uh, to follow the statutory nature conservation body's advice. Um, uh, we, we support... Uh, uh, sustainable industry appropriately located. Um, I would say the Firth of Fourth Banks was unique in the North Sea, so it was absolutely right to protect that. Um, in terms of wider ecosystem health, uh, Scotland and UK waters are amongst the most pressurised in the world. Um, the Scotland's Marine Atlas clearly shows that uh, there's concerns and declines across most of the seabed <coughs> and intertidal seas. The Scottish Government's own least damaged, more natural tranche of work as part of the Scottish MPA process clearly showed most of Scotland's seas are, are not least damaged, so they've got some damage. And, um, and a, a piece of work by Sam's corroborated that further with experts thinking there's unlikely to be any pristine habitats left on the continental shelf. Where there are good examples, um, they're often relics uh, from... Uh, that have been protected by topography or um, other infrastructure. So uh, it's saying that the marine protected areas, uh, we support them being set up on the principle of sustainable use. These are, these are not no-take zones at all. Um, but there is 
uh, an imperative there to uh, protect and improve the health of, of many of our seabed habitats, when we hope the network would help do that. OK. Um, Claudia Beamish wants to spread it out. Some other people might want to come in. Right. Uh, sure. Thank you very much, convener. Um, in fact, um, one of my quick points was to f actually following on from what um, Callum Duncan has said about the, um, the issue of the degree to which the MPAs um, which have been designated will enable um, our marine environment to be enhanced and also to recover. And that's something I'd like to put into the mix for the panellists to come back on. And then um, following on from the convener's first question, um, about have all relevant species and features been included, um, which is quite a challenging question, I suppose, within the marine environment. But, um, for instance, as a sea trout champion, I'm, um, I'm concerned about the sea trout, and I think issues have been raised about that, just to give an example. But um, equally importantly, to come back to the points already raised about the, um, the fourth banks... I would like to ask very specifically if the scientists in the room consider that the fourth bank's um, uh, protection for sand eels should have identified the sand eels as, a, as an actual feature. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the fourth banks in, out, in, out, and they're in, but should we have the sand eels as a particular feature? Thank you. Okay. Sand eels. Anyone like to talk about that? Yes, Lloyd. Uh, in relation to Claudia's three questions, I think um, in terms of the last one, sand eels are obviously, uh, as many people will know, one of the key food sources for our seabirds, and changes in the sand eel population has been one of the drivers of the seabird decline that you, you referred to, convener. And with the importance of the further forth and nearby seabird colonies, you know, we would very much support the idea that sand eels should be a feature of the Firth of Forth banks, and we think that is one of the changes to the features that we would like to see happen in, in due course. And I, I know um, the government have got in place this next stage of uh, looking at search areas for sand eels, and we'd like to see that progressed as quickly as possible because it's, it's key to the, the seabird ecology. Um, in terms of the features and species, I mentioned that before, and I'll just reiterate that we think uh, migratory species and seabirds should be included in the, SPA, in, in the MPA network, and sea trout are obviously one of those migratory species. Um, I think, um, whilst I agree with everything Bob Furness said about black guillemot being in the MPAs because uh, they are not, don't qualify as an SPA species, I think the fact that internationally important concentrations of seabirds are covered by SPAs is not a reason to not include seabirds as a feature of MPAs because there are nationally important aggregations that could be uh, protected um, under the MPA side of things. Um, and finally, on the enhancement and recovery point, I, I would agree with Claudia that uh, this is key to the there's no point in having MPAs if you don't set conservation objectives. You have to know what you want to do with them. And um, setting conservation objectives uh, for your the, the designated features uh, that simply maintains the status quo, as Callum said, the uh, Marine Atlas clearly indicates that the status quo isn't what we want to achieve. So therefore, enhancement and recovery has got to be one of our objectives in, in management terms, and so uh, greater use of recovery objectives, I think, is, is crucial. Now, Jim Hume wants to come in. I don't know if it's in the, this area, but um, it, we've got it, two it, other witnesses as well. Was, Would you it, add to this? It was really following up on, on something Mike yeah. Burrell uh, mentioned about survey. Had to come back in, and so was uh, uh, Phil Hammond. So, uh, yeah. yeah, sure, thanks very much, uh, convener. It was uh, more on the data and the surveying. Uh, Mike Burrell sort of mentioned that most of the surveying uh, had been done round about uh, where oil and gas exploration had been happening. And we also, when we hear from um, regarding fisheries and mackerel and cod, etc., we, we always hear that data is poor. So it would be interesting to hear others' views or just bring into the mix what others think of the data that we actually do know 
regarding the, the I'm marine beds. Back in. Yeah, but wait a minute, I'm going to bring you back in later, Jenny. I want to add a wee bit to it, but Mick Borwell and then Phil Hammond and then Jenny Hogan. OK, thank you, convener. I think it's worth pointing out at, at, at this point that all developers of the seabed are subject to environmental impact assessment processes, and the MPAs become just part of that, that process. So it really actually doesn't matter whether it's migratory species, seabirds, whatever it is, we take account of it in, in the EIA. What the MPA does to a certain extent is perhaps increase the robustness of the EIA that you do. On the data, the EIA process continually provides new data. Um, it's uh, the, the baseline work, monitoring afterwards, new data. Phil Hammond. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Just to add briefly about sand eels, as well as being important to seabirds, they're essential for well, many species of marine mammal. We're not here talking about seals, but seals eat a lot of sand eels. Um, but the marine mammal species that we are concerned about, minke whales, for example, maybe not rhesus dolphins, that we'll come to maybe later about the proposed MPAs, um, and other species in Scottish waters. And one piece of evidence, um, large-scale, long-term surveys have shown that harbour porpoises have moved from the northern North Sea down to the southern North Sea over a decadal scale. And the likely reason is that sand eels have declined a lot in the northern North Sea and they're all moving south where there's something to eat. So I would just add my voice to the importance of, of sand eels in this whole process. So, uh, Jenny Hogan, um, you talked about the concern that you had from renewables' point of view about the fourth banks. How much does that impact on um, the actual process of developing offshore wind in those areas. You were wanting to come back. So let's hear what, you, sure. what, what the effect is. Um, well, just briefly, first, the, the, the reason I was coming back was just on the back of uh, the comments of Jim Human and Mike Borwell, just to say that similarly, offshore renewables obviously have um, created a huge amount of uh, understanding from the survey work that, that the sector's done. And also just to highlight, which links to your question, um, that, that also does uh, create a risk of data bias um, in MPA site selection. And in other words, you protect the areas that the developers have surveyed because you have data for them, um, not necessarily because they're important sites. So that's, that's just a concern that we've had throughout the process. Um, and it's particularly is linked to our concern about the, the Firth of Forth um, banks. Um, I think, to come back to your question, there's, there is a, already a huge amount of work that the developers are doing to try to mitigate their impacts. So, for example, moving further from shore, um, reducing capacity, reducing turbines, uh, and, and so on. Um, but the, the, actually, in the socio-economic impact assessment itself, it did highlight that the management measures in particular are likely to have um, quite a significant impact on uh, the projects and, and actually potentially projects going forward at all. So that's really where our, our concern lies. Uh, so, uh, and Firth of Fourth Banks is one of the main areas. Well, I have to come back and see what management um, well, that, applications. Uh, management measures are the, are the things that will be yeah. put in place in order to try and, try and avoid uh, any kind of impacts. Uh -huh. um, so that's something that really coming on to our, our concerns for the next yeah. step. It's where, we're, where we have some, some concerns and we're keen to make sure we, we continue to speak with Marine Scotland and others to get a bit more clarity on what they are. I think that's the, main, the crux of our concern. Sure. We don't have clarity on them. Uh, Graham Day, uh, uh, we'll see how that thank goes. Thank you. And then Dave and, and take a very parochial interest as, as MSP for Angus South with proposals for wind farms off the coast of Angus and that would be involved in this. Are you, are you saying that you have some concerns or are you saying that genuinely that this process may lead to the loss of proposed offshore wind farms? Um, yes, I'm saying that, but actually the socio-economic impact itself said that. So, in other words, don't just take my word for it. It oh. was in, in that assessment itself that these could be substantial impacts. Um, I mean, I can... I can explain a bit more about you know the economic benefits that the the sector is bringing. I mean we're talking about millions of pounds of investment. We've already seen over 190 million pounds of investment from the Scottish wind farm industry without any scalable projects in the water so far. So you know these are, are huge investments. Um, you know thousands of jobs that we're talking about. Um, so really though it comes down to what those management measures are going to be in practice and we've yet to see clarity on that. So that's the next step that we need so to I, focus I, on. I don't want to be rude here, but the industry would say that, wouldn't they, potentially. So can we drill down into this? Is there a genuine threat to 
there was uh, four proposals for that sector of the sea. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a genuine threat to any or all of those proposals? I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> right. okay. Dave Thompson. Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. I'd like to just come back to something that um, uh, Professor Phil uh, Harding uh, said there about the sand eels and about a potential decline in the north. Uh, I'm, I was born and brought up in Lossiemouth, and I'm very familiar with seeing sand eels, you know, in the River Lossie and, and around the, the, the shore and everything else. And they're beautiful wee fish. I'm also the, the, the sand eel champ, so I feel obliged to speak about them anyway. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I would just wonder, why do you think there has been this decline in sand eel in the north? Because they're not a fish that we, we fish for as such in the UK, uh, to any extent. Um, I just wonder if you have any ideas as to why you think they've moved from the north to the south because most folk are saying that as the waters warm up, fish tend to be moving north to the cooler waters. Maybe they just like a hot bath, I don't know. Yep. Very briefly, so. I, probably uh, the seabird people are better equipped to answer this. Um, probably large-scale oceanographic changes over long time scales have changed the environment. We know there's good evidence for that, that the fish assemblages have changed. And I suspect that sand eels are, the declines in sand eels in the north, northern North Sea are part of that. Um, remember that the water comes across the North Atlantic, goes around the top, and then comes into the North Sea from the top. So actually, the world is kind of reversed in the North Sea. So um, the shifting of species to the north generally, in the North Sea, it's, it, it may actually work the other way around, simply because of the way the water flows. But I think it's large. It's not overfishing. It's not necessarily habitat destruction. I think the best evidence is that it's large-scale large oceanographic changes over, over a long time scale. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we've got uh, Callum, uh, and then Bob, and then Angus MacDonald. So we'll try and draw this section to a close with those three. Uh, so first of all, Callum Duncan. Uh, thank you. Um, just to... Uh, quickly support what, what Lloyd was saying about site objectives to be uh, to be ambitious and just to remind us all that the legislation requires objectives for the sites. We're only seeing objectives for individual features, so we'd like more holistic thinking about sites. To pick up on Claudia's point about features, uh, the network has to be ecologically coherent. That's quite a, a complex topic, but the most graspable element of that is it has to be representative, so represent the full range of biodiversity. So I'd just like to take the opportunity to flag some other gaps. Um, the, uh, the advice from SNH made uh, included spiny lobster burrowing sea anemone aggregations and heart cockle aggregations as being worthy of MPA protection, and they didn't find sufficient evidence, so they didn't find MPAs for those, but that doesn't mean if evidence arises, we shouldn't have MPAs for those. So it's just to flag that. Um, uh, support what Claudia was saying about sea trout. They, they are in, in decline. They spend a, a lot more time uh, around the mouths of the, the rivers that they return to, so they merit protection. In terms of evidence, there is an awful lot of evidence inshore. This point gets, I think, overstressed a lot of the time. There's, there's a lot of evidence inshore, and particularly um, our sea loss, in terms of supporting the proposals and we supported the scientific advice on that um, in terms of uh, in terms of offshore um, the I, I don't think it always is a case of data bias for example uh, one of the protected features for the Firth of Forth banks is that it's a it's a shelf bank and mound there's only so many of those in the North Sea and we know that clearly from topographical mapping so um, I, 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 th I would just back up what the, the advisors were saying about fourth banks being unique, um, and there aren't options for that. Thank you. Um, Bob Furness. Thank you, convener. I, I just wanted to return to the question of why sand deals have declined. It, it is undoubtedly very complicated. Um, there, there is clear evidence that sand eels um, spawn less in warmer sea conditions, so warming conditions probably are part of the story. But there's now um, an understanding that there are several different stocks of sand eels in the North Sea, not simply one stock over the whole North Sea. 
And there's a separate stock around Shetland as well, which has been long recognised, but there's now considered to be about seven different stocks of sand eels in the North Sea. And there are actually other species of sand eels as well. And the ones which you find in the river mouth and on the beaches are a different species from the ones which are the, the subject of the fishery. Um, Amoditis marinus is the, the major sand eel which is found offshore, uh, which is the main food of seabirds and which is the focus of the Danish sand eel fishery. And there is evidence now from Norwegian fishing on sand eels in the northern North Sea that fishing can deplete sand eel stocks and that they can take many years to recover on particular sandbanks. There's been serial depletion of some of the sandbanks in the northern North Sea, which the Norwegians now recognise. And there was evidence of a fishery impact off the east of Scotland, and that's why the area was closed to sand eel fishing. And the closure did result in a recovery of sand eels to some extent, and it did recover um, the breeding success of kittiwakes, which was one of the features that was related to that. So just to reiterate that it, it is complicated, but there's evidence both for fisheries impacts and for climate impacts, and probably there are um, predator impacts as well, and increases in stocks of adult herring, for example. Herring are a major predator on larval sand eels. And possibly the decline in the northern North Sea may partly relate to predation from predatory fish, which are a more important influence in the northern North Sea than in the south. So there is very strong grounds for arguing that sand eels are a key feature in the North Sea of huge importance to seabirds, marine mammals and to predatory fish, and therefore should be something that we're very concerned about protecting. Dave Thompson had a quick point on this before we come back to... Angus, and yeah, th Ross wants to have a sorry. Ross wants to have a point in this, and then Angus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, convener. Um, uh, very interesting point there about the the, the fishing for the uh, the sand eels and uh, by the by the Norwegians. Um, and obviously, th that's a matter for the EU because the EU are the ones who negotiate. You know, the sort of overall fishing. I'm not sure if the Norwegians are fishing in their own waters or in Scottish waters. Um, but it sounds to me as if there's an EU-wide um, need to ensure that there are plenty sand eels and that we shouldn't necessarily be fishing for them at all, maybe. Other people pick up that point. Um, uh, Ross, yeah. welcome. Just uh, hey, convener, thanks for that. Talking about the sand eels, it is recognised that there are distinct populations and the fishing advice, the quota is split into distinct areas in the North Sea. You can't just catch all your quota in one area. Um, the UK stroke Scottish fleet are not involved in sand eel fishing. Haven't been for some time. I know one boat, uh, X Barra, five, six years ago was the last time they went to it and the quotas were so small. But because of the biology of the sand eel, the quotas are only decided in year. It's not a case of saying you've got a recruitment we can see it coming into fishing in two, three years' time, like Haddock. Sand eels, it's a season-to-season season quota that's set out. And what they do is almost like an exploratory trial fishing. And then, on the results of that, they then set the quotas for the current year. So there, it is recognised that it, it is a pressure stock. Okay. Thank you. For that, for, we'll bring you back in a minute. Angus MacDonald's. Uh, thanks, Convener. And clearly, we could devote half the meeting to, to sand eels uh, uh, by the sound of it, but it is um, fascinating. I mean, I've certainly been interested in, in the sand eel issue since uh, uh, the Danes were coming over to the, the, the wee banky in, uh, in the 90s uh, and hoovering up the sand eels for the, the Biomar factory uh, in, in my constituency. Um, so it's, it's just a, an observation, really, that. Um, you know, we should be thankful that the Danes are no longer coming over uh, and hoovering up the sand eels in the wee banky. Indeed. Um, so the difficulties of spawning sand eels reminds me of pandas, but I think we better <laughs> keep away from that subject. Alec Ferguson's got our next question. Yeah, as the Scottish Conservative representative on the committee, I think we should move on from pandas, if I may suggest <laughs> it, convener. Um, but <laughs> the... Um, Earlier in the discussion, Jenny Hogan mentioned socio-economic impact of, of, of these proposals, and I just wondered whether we might have a little useful further discussion on, on, on that. Um, we know that Marine Scotland did quite a lot of work in trying to identify and mitigate, if they might be called, the worst impact of, of, the, of the proposals. And I just wondered whether members around the table are content that um, basically the, the, 
the socio-economic impacts have all been identified, where they've been identified, whether they have been mitigated through the proposals, um, and, and generally any comments on that that anybody might wish to make. Right, Callum Duncan first. Yeah. Um, just as a, um, a response to the, the phrase mitigate the worst impact, I mean, I know, I know you're trying to do shorthand of... Um, you know what these MPs might mean just to take the opportunity to say that we should be looking at these a, a lot more positively these are about uh, they're not about just protectionism and, and ring fencing features for their own sake these uh, mosaics of habitats uh, particularly a lot of the invertebrate species and the habitats they create are the building blocks for the marine ecosystem so everything that we enjoy from the sea derives from all these pieces of the puzzle working properly and efficiently. And the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the paperwork for the consultation made clear that the, uh, the socioeconomic benefits, actually, if you factored in all societal uses and values, actually outweighed uh, the quantifiable costs to to the range of industries, and, and that itself w was an underestimate. Um, a, a piece of work that was done for the National Ecosystem Assessment uh, actually estimated that the, um, the, 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 the net, well, it was a subset of the network, the study did 20 sites, would provide an estimate that 67 to 117 million pounds in annual recreational benefits and the protection would generate a total one-off non-use value of 125 to 255 million pounds. And then there's also a wider question of if, if, we, if we do sustainably manage these sites, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of sustainability benefits to be derived from that in terms of sustainable tourism, sustainable fishing, uh, and uh, sustainable energy use, etc. So there's, it's about win-wins if we get it right. And it's not just about cost. There's an awful lot of benefits there. Okay, uh, Ross, Dougal, and then I like to follow up some of these points. Yeah, Ross, yep. Dougal. No, it, it was one of our earlier concerns. I mean, the, the Scottish Fisheries Federation was involved in a lot of the early work in MPAs. Um, some of our concerns were in general, in general, they've all been addressed now. And that was in the legality of what was being done and the quality of evidence. And Sam's have obviously done a good job there. But the MPAs are there to protect features that are evidenced. It's not an anti-fishing measure. And in the socio-economic impacts, the, the information coming forward was very late. Um, I should have perhaps said this earlier when you're asking about the process. The process was rushed. I mean, the, the, to get the three big consultations all at once, just the staffing required in Marine Scotland simply wasn't there to handle that quantity of work and we're still working through it um, the federation has been involved in a lot of the management measure and displacement surveys coastal meetings they've helped refine um, the location of the features based on evidence and fishing evidence has been provided in addition to what the oil and gas have done in terms of the, the bottom so the management measures are the really important thing, and that's what's going to take up the time for this next year. And we're heavily involved in that. And all we would say is equity of management measures with other seabed users. Now, I, I do know the renewables have a particular problem, and certainly down about the fourth banks. But uh, one of the features which is not in the MPA is actually one of the proposed renewable sites. Motion Quahog one of the main concentrations it's actually outside the MPA so go figure setting where MPAs are indeed interesting um, Lloyd uh, and then Jenny thank you Kavina um, on the question of socio-economic um, implications I just wanted to reiterate uh, and remind everyone of the process point that was debated at the time when the act was uh, passed um, and that is that uh, it was agreed, and, and you may remember there was a correspondence between the Cabinet Secretary and the then convener uh, of the predecessor committee. 
um, related to this issue of how um, the selection and the designation of sites would be on a purely scientific basis and it would be management measures that would be uh, where the implications of socio-economic impacts were taken into account. And in relation to the difference between MPAs and SPAs and SACs, the way in which the Cabinet Secretary and the Government take into account socio-economic implications is different. That's the difference between the international European protection and the national domestic protection provided by the Marine Act. But in both cases, socio-economic implications can be taken into account, and that is the discussion, as Ross says, we're, we're going into in this, in this coming phase. Uh, but I think it is important to make sure that we, don't, that we do distinguish between taking into account socio-economic implications in management measures and taking them into account in selection and designation, which we all agreed at the time the Act was passed we should not do. Okay, and uh, Jenny, and then Mick. Um, yeah, just to come back on, I think, all of those points that have been made, that um, yes, it is the management measures, that's absolutely the priority for us now, um, and that's where the, the risks may still lie, but hopefully the opportunities um, that we can all coexist. Um, just to say as well about the, the costs that were identified um, in the socio-economic impact, um, they were an underestimation in terms of the impacts on the renewables sector. So they were, they were identified as potentially very significant, could make some projects unviable, but still an underestimation of, of costs of things like delays, for example. Um, and uh, draft SPAs have been mentioned a couple of times just to highlight that similarly we have similar concerns basically for the, the draft SPAs but um, I don't want to go too off topic um, and lastly just to point out that the, our other concern is just about how the MPA network will actually be reviewed so again similar issues there about you know, what the impact might be on, on socio-economic opportunities Mick <coughs> Okay thanks convener. this is about economics but it, I'm going to start at the environmental impact assessment. One of the issues that we've identified is that um, the screening process that has to go on when you want to undertake an activity in, inside the MPA requires you to um, demonstrate that you, you're not having a significant impact. We don't know what that means and nobody can explain that to us. We're at the forefront of science here. We don't, we don't know what it is. The result of that it forces you into what we call a Habsreg assessment or uh, an appropriate assessment which is much more rigorous. Uh, the implication is that you are having some impact. Uh, the, the end of the process in uh, European marine sites is invocation of the Europi process. And within the Europi process, somebody has to make the balance of the socio-economics against the um, impact on the environment. We have no rules on this, and the uncertainty that that can provide will affect investor confidence. So there's a, there's a circle there. OK. Um, Alec, did you want to Can I just make one, one point, yeah? maybe? And, I, and yeah. I, understand, I, I think I understand what everybody's been saying, which I think is basically that the devil's going to be in the detail. If, if, if it is a devil, the devil's going to be in the detail of, of the proposed management uh, agreements that are worked out. But I, 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 and I, under, I absolutely understand the need for sustainability. And perhaps I should have rephrased, if I could rephrase my first question, instead of saying the worst impact, I might use the phrase negative impact, because I think they were, there were negative impacts raised during the consultation period. But I, I might just pose a little question, if I may, and, because I understand the importance of, of sustainability in all of this. Um, and I would just pose the question of, can you achieve sustainability across the network if, if the network itself is not ecologically coherent, as some people have suggested it won't be without the addition of further MPAs across it. Anyone want to quickly answer that point just now about uh, sustainability if there's not a uh, yes, Callum? I mean, I suppose the, the short answer to that is you, no. <laughs> well, that's fine then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, you, we 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 need we need the network of sites in 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 the context of a uh, a, a marine planning system that that also considers the the wider eighty percent of the sea as well, as Sam's was saying in their written submission. Um, but you know, sustainability is all about keeping the sea working and improving the the biodiversity and health of it. 
which is a legal requirement and we would say is a, uh, an ecological requirement as per the, the examples I gave earlier. Okay. Um, I think we've kind of got to the end of that point just now. Yeah? Yeah. I think we should look at the management principles next. And Graham Day is going to lead on that. Thank you, Convener. Um, I've got a series of questions. We'll kick off with your views on whether uh, any and all uh, public authorities and regulators whose decision making uh, might impact upon MPAs are they equipped with the necessary skills to determine what posing significant risk? to the conservation objectives of the MPAs uh, might look like. And I can broaden that out. I just wonder what the panel's understanding is of how land use changes, uh, which might increase pollution through runoff, be taken into account, and whether cumulative impacts are going to be monitored and assessed. OK, who's up for that then? Yes, Mick. Thanks, Convener. Loaded question, that one. Uh, start perhaps at the end, um, and I would also... Cumulative effects assessment is a thing that we surely have to get to grips with very quickly. And it's another one of these things that nobody knows how to do. So the plea is that we work with the SNCBs, with the regulators, to come up with um, a methodology for cumulative effects assessment. Um, I, 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 the, are they, are they, the, the regulators and advisors equipped? There, at the forefront of their knowledge as well um, and one thing that we no do notice uh, south of the border as well is that because of this lack of knowledge and experience you get an iteration of questions when you're trying to develop something you present your evidence they then find that that evidence might not be good enough you've got to go through another cycle another cycle and it, that's very difficult for a developer to deal with so standards of evidence is, is an important thing that we, we need to land. Very good. Did, was there someone else who wanted to comment on this? It seems to me, you know, that the guidance and skills to determine the significant risks in the agencies, you know, what are you? Sanguine? I, I think uh, to some extent I agree, agree with Mick that many of the regulators and agencies and indeed all the participants in this round table are sometimes uh, at the edge of our, our knowledge and um, we're moving towards a new system. We haven't had a planning system in the marine environment before, so clearly we, have, we, we don't know how to run it yet because it's just coming up and running. But in that sense, I think it's important to put the MPAs and the SPAs in a context of that wider marine planning system because, as uh, Callum indicated, uh, that 80 percent of the seas will not be in protected areas and what's how those are managed will impact on protected areas and vice versa uh, so that, that's a reason for hoping that the marine plan that was consulted on at the same time as the MPAs make some progress as quickly as possible and that the agencies and the regulators get up to speed with, with implementing that. I think, Graham, you've identified many of the key issues that we would ask questions about, um, that the implication of on-land activities affecting coastal and inshore uh, marine areas is an important one and that's the reason why the marine plan and the terrestrial plans and the river basin management plans which do span the coastal strip need to work in harmony with one another and the different agencies responsible for those different plans working together and liaising and coordinating their activities. Okay, Ross. Yeah, just one general point. I mean, the level of science required is not there. And the funding for it, more importantly, is not there. And with budget restraints all round, I mean, we see this in fish biology, for instance, apart from anything else. SEPA for in are supposed to take care of the water and runoffs, and I know that a aquaculture have sometimes problems getting projects done because SEPA say, well, that's the local council deal with that, and it should be SEPA. Uh, going on to your point about the fact that there's a lot of water which isn't in MPAs. Displacement comes into this. We see that, and that's one of the reasons why we've been working so hard, if you like, to, to refine fishing activity within 
the MPA so that only the features designated are actually protected because the worst case scenario is that you displace people into other areas and that will have a bigger impact. Um, for instance, the, on the announcement of the MPAs, the, the industry, Scottish fishing industry came up with some voluntary management measures in 11 sites within three MPAs pending the full discussions that are going to take place over the next year because it was recognised that those features needed immediate protection once the MPAs were announced. Otherwise, I think uh, it could have been problems for the Scottish Government. It could have been infraction proceedings. So industry is working to try and do things. But there is got to be a balance um, so that fishing can exist. OK. Nigel, Don. Uh, can I try and say what I'm trying to say with, without anybody taking offence? Because I, 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 don't, I don't mean to be in any sense rude or, or disparaging about what's being said. But I get the impression. I get the impression that if we were sitting here again in maybe 10 years' time, we'll recognise this is very much the beginning of a process where, as I say, without being t too unkind, we don't really know what we're trying to do. Or if we do know what we're trying to do, we're not sure how to do it. Uh, and we don't have as much information as we'd like. Actually, you never do have as much information as you would like. And we're not really quite sure what the tools are, and we're not actually sure what the implications are. But, and I think this is the important bit, we recognise we've got a problem to solve, and we actually have to get on with it. Uh, and therefore, maybe all the industries and activities represented here just need to understand that somewhere or other we're going to go up a learning curve and we've got to make this work. Right, Tim Lloyd Austin and then Callum Duncan quickly. I think um, in response to that, I, I, I agree that there is a steep learning curve to go and uh, many of the agencies and um, the government itself have got to develop, learn and, and get the process working. The one thing I would slightly disagree with is we don't know what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I think we know what the outcome is we're trying to reach and that is... Uh, a, uh, a fully functioning marine ecosystem that supports all of the industries and things that benefit on that, uh, on that ecosystem as well as the components of that ecosystem in terms of species and habitats. So that outcome we, we know and we know that a ecologically coherent network of protected areas within that wider ecosystem managed through an overall planning system is a means to do that. Where we get the learning curve comes into effect is how we implement the components that I've just described of that outcome. So we know the outcome, we know what many of the components are, but how we operate those components is the challenge where there is a, a, a big learning curve and, as somebody said, the need for more science. Is that, I, I was just trying to distinguish between knowing what outcome we're trying to achieve and how we achieve it. And uh, Callum Dunn. Thank you. Um, I mean, my second point was, as, as Lloyd said, you know, we, just to emphasise that, we do know what we want to achieve. We want to protect all these component parts. Um, and uh, there's discussions to be had about how ambitious that protection is. Um, and, and those are to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I, I would say that it's clear that we need to be more ambitious than what was put out in some of the management options as part of the consultation. But again, it's about sustainable use on a case-by-case -case basis. And just to go back to Graham Day's question about the terrestrial uh, marine link, um, just to highlight quite an interesting case study where uh, maybe 10 years or so ago there was a proposal to put a I'm getting quite specific here, but illustrates the point to put a sewage outfall in North Lamlash Bay, uh, the, uh, there's a big mural bed there. The uh, environmental consultants went and surveyed the area. They weren't told to look for mural. They didn't record mural. According to them, there wasn't any mural. It was up to local divers, citizen scientists trained in sea search to actually convince the authorities that there was mural there. And lo and behold, they were correct. Um, so uh, at least now we're in a position where people know there's such a thing as merle, as well as flame shells and horse mussels and cold water corals and deep sea sponge fields and all these fantastic habitats. And uh, I think collectively we agree that it would, it's very important for Scotland to protect all these component parts.
Okay, Graham Day, finally on this point. Yeah, uh, thanks, Graham. Just to kind of wrap this up, I, I just want to be satisfied that, um, that every everyone around the table buys into the notion, or maybe they don't, that what we're trying to achieve here is a, an environmentally responsible coexistence of all the component parts, and that we don't get into a situation where there is a push to simply get oil and gas, renewables and fishing all removed altogether, that we are looking for a balance here. Is that right? I mean, we would all buy into that. Yeah. People are nodding. Yeah. Ross? <laughs> I'll, I'll just I'll make a, a, a one sentence. MPA management plans should not be seen by stakeholders as a mean to resolve non-nature conservation issues. And I think that addresses the point that you're making, Graham. Thank you. Um, Claudia Beamish will take your point next. Right. Thank you, convener. Um, really following on from uh, my colleague Graham Day's point, the MPA management policy is set out in detail in the draft handbook. And I understand that there are five overarching management principles and those that know them better than I will bear with me if I, if I very briefly outline those uh, before asking some questions um, to set the scene for this part of the panel discussion. Um, we have that the management of MPA should be integrated with wider marine management, which we have touched on already. Um, that additional powers such as marine conservation orders or MCOs will be available where necessary that the best available scientific information will be used to select and manage MPAs, that, uh, fourthly, as understanding improves, um, and I emphasise this point, but I would as a Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change, um, and, and as the environment changes, there may be a need to select additional new MPAs, um, alter boundaries or remove designations, um, i.e. future-proofing. And lastly, the MPAs will be subject to a range of protection levels depending on the conservation objectives. And there will be an assumption of multiple use of a site. And the last part of that fifth point is that, however, activities which are not compatible with the conservation objectives of an MPA will be restricted. So um, uh, on the basis of that, we've already heard from, um, from Mike and from Lloyd um, and others about um, the, the whole range of, so sorry, at yeah, the wrong angle, I do apologise, <laughs> my mistake, um, about the, the, talking about the broader issues around uh, Scotland seas, and with 20% of Scotland seas, as I understand it, specifically protected, um, is marine planning and the wider marine in, um, management regime sufficient to ensure adequate protection of the remaining 80%, and although um, Sam, um, Sam's isn't able to be here today, uh, they have highlighted this issue and expressed concerns about it. Um, so, as well, do the MCOs provide the appropriate structure to achieve conservation objectives and resolve conflicts in a site where there are multiple uses? And I take the point that fisheries aren't included, as I understand it, in, in the MCO um, possible orders. And lastly, are the circumstances where Scottish ministers do not have exclusive competence, um, some cause for concern. Right, thank you. Okay, who wants to kick off on that then? Respond. Right, Mick. Um, <clears throat> it actually comes back to something we touched on, and it's, it's about the remaining 80%, and it's my point that the remaining 80% is still subject to environmental impact assessment by developers. Within that environmental impact assessment, there is a legal requirement to undertake a cumulative impact assessment, looking at what other industries might be on the same patch. We're just not very good at it at the minute. How you uh, reinforce that, I don't know. We work, we, there, there are processes now in place where we understand what wind uh, or offshore renewables are, are going to be in an area. They understand where we are. And we're, again, it's the start of that process. So I think from a developer's side, that remaining 80% is, is well covered. Okay. Thank you. Lloyd Austin. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I think, generally speaking, we support the five principles. They are generic and, um, uh, 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 and aim for the kind of integrated management regime that I think we, we support. Um, I, I think... Uh, <coughs> 
I'd reiterate what I said before about the need to get the marine plan up and running. I think the, the marine plan was consulted on at the same time as the MPAs, and yet we have the MPAs have moved on a stage, but the marine plan uh, remains where it was with waiting for Marine Scotland to make progress and, and, and publish it. And I think in terms of the management of the sea as a whole, that marine plan is a key uh, aspect of the Marine Act that we'd like to see rolled out and implemented. Um, I think um, MCOs are part of the uh, range of tools that Scottish ministers and other uh, regulators have at their disposal. Um, and they should be used where appropriate, where it's needed in a case-by-case -case basis. And just uh, on the question you raise about fisheries not being included, fisheries are not included in that piece of legislation because there are other pieces of legislation available to Scottish ministers to use if there is a need. Ross may disagree about if there is a need to use them, uh, but Scottish ministers would be able to make up their own mind. They have other tools at their disposal to manage fisheries, if that makes sense. So that's just a legislative answer to the question. Uh, we may or may not disagree how those tools are used, but they are there. Um, I think... Um, the key, though, in overall terms, in terms of management, is the need to ensure that the management objectives uh, aim for the right outcome as a whole. I think there are, there are too few objectives that are about recovery and enhancing, which I think you mentioned earlier, Claudia. And I think the overall intention of the government of, of applying management measures uh, rather than simply allowing the status quo to to carry on and, and not, not apply management measures is something that we're slightly concerned about. I think there is too much emphasis on designating things and saying job done rather than uh, saying, well, now we've got that in place, what do we need to do? Now, nobody is suggesting we always need to do lots of things and what we need to do has to be evidence-based and, uh, and so forth, but it's important that we don't just have a have a, what I would say is a sort of um, it's probably being undiplomatic but complacent approach of saying well we've got these designated let's uh, let them be what we need to do is is look after them and achieve our objectives uh, Ross Dougal and then Callum Duncan yeah just following on from what Lloyd said uh, the reason why MPs have been announced is quite simple, there was a 12-month deadline from the start of the consultation that they had to be announced. And that's why they've been announced and the other stuff has been put in the back shelf, going back to the amount of work available to go into the rest of it. And if I may be slightly political, it's like a lot of things just now, we're waiting on stuff and I think it will depend on whether the referendum in one shape or another is needing a good news day. OK, um, that's a point we might want to take up in a while, but uh, Callum Duncan? Um, just to reiterate, in answer to Claudia's question, you know, yes, we support those principles. Um, you know, the, the, the whole question then becomes, um, and the whole discussion is around where uh, activities are or are not compatible with features and what it is that we want to achieve um, for those features, uh, and as Lloyd says, uh, you know, fisheries legislation is available to provide protection from fisheries uh, where where merited. Um, I, I just like to make the point about um, trying to think a bit more holistically about these MPAs. You know, we, we've we've got a process that. You know, you, you have to organise and categorise what the marine environment is in order to um, go through a process to arrive at places that are important in the sea to protect. So you, there's a sort of disaggregation that happens there. But at this end of the process, we need to be sort of integrating that so that we're not just thinking about um, managing little patches of leftovers in our MPAs. And just to put it into perspective... Um, the, the 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 part it's not f four MPAs that have recovery objectives. It's little patches in 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 three MPAs 
of, of mural beds and fl flame shell beds. These are little small areas. Um, so I'd like to think that we, we can think a bit more holistically. We actually need to look at the legislation and recognise that the objective should be for the site overall, uh, not just for the features and what we want these sites to do. And whilst I agree with Ross, they're not fisheries management measures, we have to, in thinking about how we manage sites, we should be recognising how protecting and where appropriate recovering uh, these building blocks of the ecosystem uh, can deliver these sort of secondary benefits. And, and that sort of thinking should also be taken into marine planning as well so that we're doing proper ecosystem-based marine planning uh, to deliver the sustainable development that the plan should be in the sense of living within environmental limits. And, and that wider process uh, has to, as I think this committee concluded a few years ago or an earlier version of which, that, that fisheries management has to integrate with marine planning outside in, as well as inside MPAs. Right, Claudia Beamish. <laughs> uh, thank you, convener. Um, just in addition to those responses, are there any comments from the panel about whether it's a realistic aim to implement all the measures for the MPAs by the end of 2016? 2016, that is. The president. Ross. I think it will go back to what's already been said. The, you refer to the Nature Conservation MPA Management Handbook, which is there, but it's broad brush in some cases. To get the actual evidence required to harden up in some of these things, as Callum talked about, if you're talking about recovery um, of a merrow bed or flame shell bed, where do you stop? I mean, what size is big enough? He's saying they're very small areas. Well, perhaps that's fine. Who knows? Just saying you should have more, there's got to be some sort of edge put on that, and that's where the problem is going to be. We're work well, we are seriously working very hard on the management measures and trying to make things work, but it's going to be a long slog. Um, on the top of the MPs, the Federation, as Mick knows, and the uh, Renewables knows, we're involved in a lot of the li in discussions in the licensing process there as to where s things are going to be cited, perhaps modifications of cables, um, the track they're going to take, which are going to avoid areas which perhaps are beneficial to fishermen, but also may be beneficial in terms of features. I think there's some of the BT communication cables on going in and out of Jura, I think actually go right through MPAs. So, you know, joined up thinking has got to be there. And there is going to have to be a balance. All I'm saying is I think everybody around here is will, wants to work towards a balanced position. Mick, yes. Uh, thanks, Convener. At, at, at a site level, there is one of the management measures that we will have a great deal of difficulty complying with. Um, it calls for deposited material should meet local habitat type, which means don't put, if you've got a mud or a sand seabed, don't put something like rocks that weren't there in the first place. We use this technique to stabilise pipelines particularly. Um, and that's a safety feature. It's a safety feature for the fishing fleet as well as for the, the contents of the pipeline itself. And that is a management measure that we will have great difficulty with. As Ross says, we'll work with the, uh, uh, the regulators and advisors how to uh, determine the impact of that. Whether we can do it by 2016 was the question. I, I don't know. Jenny. Uh, Jenny Hogan. Just to see as well that, first of all, we... Um, support the principles of the management options, the, the measures. Um, we also welcome a statement in the management options that says that uh, renewable energy impact assessments uh, will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis through EIA, so that's positive. Um, but I think that, uh, to highlight the one area that we've got some concerns with, um, it's stated in the, the draft management handbook, the ability to amend a consent in light of uh, MPA designation and monitoring. Um, and so that's obviously a, well, clearly a very important issue for licensed activities um, as it introduces uncertainty to the consent. 
um, and it's also stated that there's no legal duty to review consents. So that's an area that we, we still have some concern about, um, and that also relates back to the, the reviews of the, the MPA networks as well. So okay, uh, Lloyd Austin. Um, I was going to make a point about the targets, but just before I do that, on, on, on amending and reviewing consents, I mean, that is a statutory ability for Scottish ministers anywhere. It's not new for the marine environment. It exists on land, and it's part of the habitats regulations, for instance, for all Natura sites everywhere. I mean, that doesn't mean that ministers use it frequently or very often or are very keen to use it, uh, but it's there in the statutory framework. I don't think that's a, a particularly new or uh, different thing. Um, in terms of Claudia's previous questions about the 2016 target, I think 2016 target will be challenging uh, for all the reasons we've discussed in terms of uncertainty and science and the ability of regulators and everything to, uh, to get up to speed and get the processes working and for all the discussions that uh, everybody's talking about happening. Um, so it's challenging, but we ought to, it is the OSPAR target, the OSPAR target that the Scottish Government is uh, signed up to is to have a well-managed network of MPAs by the end of 2016. And beyond that, there's the EU target under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive to meet the target of good environmental status for the marine environment by 2020. And uh, a key component of good environmental status is an ecologically coherent network of well-managed MPAs. So we do have those sort of overarching uh, international sort of uh, agreements uh, to deliver this. And so whilst challenging, uh, it's really our responsibility to step up to the plate and try and make it work. Okay, we had a view about reviews and things like that. Jim Hume, I think you want to... Yes, just to, yeah. just to f follow on for that. Um, we're talking about uh, achieving conservation objectives um, and uh, reviewing these at, on a six-yearly time period. Um, <coughs> I just wonder if the panel members uh, would agree that a six-year uh, reporting back to Parliament uh, is appropriate. Uh, is, is it realistic to actually expect significant change within a six-year period? Or should it be a shorter period? It um, be interesting to hear different members of the panel's views on that. Right, who's first then? Time scales. Mick, thank you for... I think whilst... Keep it. Thank you, convenience. When you're on a steep learning curve, I think six years is probably right. It sounds very short, but it's probably about right. One thing I would say is that there is no mention of reviewing the impact assessment within the same time frame. And I think that it should be coupled with a six-year review. Okay. N nobody else is... Uh, J Graham Day, you perhaps have a point. Nobody seems to want to comment more or agree with what Mick says. Well, it would indeed, yes, yes but um, they didn't offer. Right, so there's Phil Hammond. Well, just to say, for species that have slow life histories, if you like, long lived species, six years is plenty enough, really, because unless there's a really serious impact on them, which you would probably know about for other reasons, you don't really need to monitor any more than six years, even ten years, because these species have very long life cycles. But I recognise, of course, that these species are, are if you like, the, the, at the top of the food chain, and, and the species underneath are, mm -hmm. in many ways, much more important because they're supporting those. So, But from long-lived species, six years is fine. Mike, do you want to say something about that? You're involved um, yeah, with some I can of the longer-lived species. Yeah, I, I can reiterate Phil's comments on the fact that six years is an, an adequate and accepted in other processes, such as the SAC process um, and the other processes involving um, Nutria 2000. So I think that six years is adequate. However, I, I would also admit as well, when we consider some of the species we're looking at, such as minke whale and uh, resource dolphin, that there can be annual changes in the distribution of those species due to foraging and association with different key foraging sites. So there may be importance for, you know, a smaller period of time, but I think that it's widely accepted that six years is an, an adequate period for investigation. Do you actually have something to add, Callum, to that, or are we just going to reiterate what's been said? I think you wanted to say something just now about the six-year period. Well, I, I was just responding to your earlier request, then you, you invited Mike in, but it was just to, from from our perspective, say six years s seems not unrealistic. That's good. Uh, Alec Ferguson. I, I just wanted to... 
draw out a point that Lloyd Austin mentioned, which was, I think if I picked him up right, under European oh, no, legislation, we're required to have an ecologically Central. coherent network by 2020. And I wonder, it, given, given Environment Link's insistence that the suggested network is probably not fully uh, coherent without the addition of further MPAs, how we can possibly achieve, and um, 2020 is six years from now, so how can we achieve that uh, coherence to satisfy European standards within that time period, if, if, if we stick to that six-year time period? Well, I, I, we've, we've not suggested that the additional sites or the additional features that we think are necessary for, uh, to make the network uh, coherent need to wait for six years. So um, I think, um, you know, we, we think that, that the announcement, both of the MPAs and the draft SPAs, was a very positive move and a good step forward. Um, but that's not complete for the reasons we've explained earlier. And there needs to be further development of that. But that further development doesn't have to wait till the six-year review. Uh, the six-year review is of the network as a whole, whatever the network is. But you can add at any time, ministers can add at any time. And in relation to the SPAs, I mean, it's quite clear that the Commission and the Directive requires ministers to add further SPAs. I mean, it was part of the announcement, and they won't wait six years to, to comply with that. That's okay. Thank you. Graham Day. Yeah, yeah thank you, Convener. Um, given that we've heard today about how we're embarking on a steep learning curve here, I, I just wonder, right now, is our ability to assess improvement, uh, to measure it sufficiently strong, and if it isn't, will it be in six years' time? And, and, and taking up um, Ross Dougal's point, don't we need to determine now how much improvement is enough? Where do we need to be in six years' time to be able to say, yeah, now we need to review it? OK, let's be more precise then. Yes, Lloyd Austin. Well, my view is that that is about the question of setting conservation objectives. The setting of conservation objectives, what we want to achieve with these sites, whether that, for some people, that might be the status quo, for others it might be a 10% increase in the size of a piece of habitat or a 20% increase in the population of a species or whatever. But the important thing is that we have that debate about what our objectives are so that we know whether or not we've achieved them. Sorry, to be clear, do we have the ability to measure this accurately? right across the range of the MPAs, all the different... Uh, not for everything everywhere, but we have to do what we can with the knowledge that we've got and put in place the mechanisms to the, the research and the surveys to fill the, fill the gaps in our knowledge. Is that why uh, Richard Lockhead said in March uh, that uh, in the majority of MPA designations there will simply be a designation so that we are aware of the marine feature? Uh, other MPAs will have management plans attached to them where that's required, but I do not expect there to be a huge number of such MPAs. Why do you think he said that? Well, that was uh, the issue that I was referring to earlier. I was that we were concerned that they actually were going to have management measures for a minority of MPAs. I mean, we don't know uh, how this is going to pan out, but we think we need to be clear about what our conservation objectives are for all of the MPAs and where no intervention is needed to achieve those objectives, then there's no need for any management. But where intervention is needed, then there should be management plans. But there, is a, there needs to be a process to do both of those things, determine the objectives and if those objectives need management, implement the management. And I, I, I don't think we're yet in a position to say what proportion of MPAs would be in one camp and what proportion would be in the other camp. So we're slightly concerned that the Cabinet Secretary did make that statement that the majority would have no action. You know, I think there's another reason. It's about staff and cash. And resource, yeah. Is that not central to the whole of this uh, development that we're talking about at the moment? And that indeed, you know, Ross Dougal uh, hinted at it, the question about whether you can have enough uh, people actually working in this and how you actually fund that. 
Yeah, I think the, the question of resource and whether there is adequate resource to deliver the objectives that everybody has signed up to and the Act requires is, is, is something that's worth debating. Indeed, is it worth campaigning about? Just go back to something that was said earlier. That all that everybody talks about is best available science. That is not necessarily good science. Best available science can be very little. It can be somebody going down with an aqualung and saying, oh, I saw a flame shell. You know what? I'm not being facetious, but there is a great range of it, and the the best available science is not always good enough. And I think you're right, uh, Convener, that I don't think there is the staffing available to do this job for all the MPAs that are there. And we made that point when, they, when this, all this kicked off. You can set them, you can do them, but how are you going to monitor progress? How are you going to do this? We'll play our part, but it still leaves a big gap. OK. Uh, Mick uh, Borwell and then Callum Duncan in uh, this Be set. Thank you, Convener. Because of that issue, that there is the lack of cash within government and its science advisors, it brings me back to the point I made before about standards of evidence. The SNCBs, when they're acting as statutory consultees, have to say to industry, when you're doing monitoring, these are the questions that we need answered. And if one of those questions is around the conservation objectives and the status of a site, they need to say so. And then we will undertake appropriate monitoring. Just a second point, and I'm, I know I'm going back and I shouldn't, on the coherence of the ecological network and the meeting the standard for the MSFD in 2020, that is based on the regional sea, which is the North Sea. So it's not just the Scottish MPAs. It's the entirety of the UK's MPA network, which includes English um, MCZs and the SACs. So, And Callum Duncan? Um, it, we could obviously do with more resources, as monitoring is needed. <laughs> Keep putting our hands yeah. over this and see but where it, is it going to come from? <clears throat> but to pick up on Ross's point, there is, um, the, the, ev the best available evidence does include very good quality citizen science data from sea search that's quality assured by um, by NGOs so uh, and and that that data has been uh, tested with commissioned re reports from SNH and has stood up very well um, I, I I would also want to highlight the pick up on a point that Mick made right at the start of this session about um, data being available from oil and gas that's because and, and other sectors. That's because there's requirements under EIA and habitat regs appraisals for those industries to actually do surveys, um, particularly if they impact European marine sites offshore, uh, because um, appropriate assessment is needed so that in, the burden of proof is on industry to prove that their activity would not damage a feature. And, uh, and the you know, it's important to, um, to to recognise that there's been a big ongoing discussion about that in relation to fishing, um, and and with a, a series of correspondences with the MMO in England, and the conclusion of that was that um, our, for SACs, Article 6.3 should apply, and therefore a risk-based review of fishing should should be triggered. So there's a question there about who, you know, where the, the where the burden of evidence gathering should be. If an activity, and, and that, that applies to whatever the activity is, wishes to um, undertake uh, some, some activity, some, some development, some work, whatever the industry is. So um, it would be, uh, we, you know, we welcome any um, socioeconomic sector that can, can provide data to prove that what they're doing won't have an impact. Oil and gas, renewables, all these sort of people. And fishing. That, that information is... Uh, yeah, and fisheries as well. Kremde. Just to be clear, you're talking about if we wouldn't have an impact, would the conservationists amongst us here today accept um, evidence that was coming forward from the oil and gas sector, for example, if they broadened out their survey work to, to assess perhaps improvement in the areas of MPAs, would you accept that as robust 
and a base, a, a baseline for making judgments. Well, I say in the perspective of a seabird ecologist that our knowledge of the distribution of seabirds at sea in UK waters is largely from work that was generated by oil and gas. It's the European Seabirds at Sea database, and that is fundamental for, amongst other things, to defining which areas should be considered as SPAs for seabirds foraging at sea. So we do accept that. that a lot of scientific effort has gone into the development of that programme of survey, um, and, and the science has been published and is robust, and, and so we would very much support the fact that the oil and gas industry has, has helped to develop that. So, so, so in, in terms of when we're talking about limited uh, governmental resource, that could be supplemented by uh, Mick Borwell's members and the work that they do, and you, and you would accept that? Yes, yeah. and, and the um, offshore renewables um, developments are using the same European Seabirds at Sea methods for their sites as well, and providing the data into a central database. And very and briefly, Lloyd Austin. Mike? Yeah, I'd just like to support comments as well that in the same way as for seabirds, many of the same methodologies developed are important for marine mammals and cetacean species as well. And that really is fed into a large program of work in terms of uh, the joint cetacean protocol at a UK and European level, and also, I imagine, into the works of uh, Professor Phil Hammond at SMRU with regards to other large-scale surveys for marine mammals as well. Thank you. Uh, Lloyd Austin. Yeah, I'd agree entirely with what Bob Vanessa Micah said and, and with what Mick said about the oil industry. A lot of the developers provide a lot of information, which is good science through EIAs and so forth. The one caveat I would add to that is that in some circumstances, some EIA information is held to be commercially confidential, and it's important that government finds a way of getting data in those documents into the wider public domain. Um, our onshore, the Scottish Wind Farm Bird Monitoring Group is doing good work with industry to bring that information together in order for it to be widely available and published. And I think uh, a mechanism like that in the marine environment would be worth exploring to make the information more available in the way that, as Bob has said, oil industry information has become available in the past. So I think that the, the one caveat I would say is it's all very good what's being done by different industries in different ways, but making the data widely available to government and others is an important thing that needs to be done. You'd have thought that that would have been part of the EIA process, that it is available. You would have thought so. Mike, Mick? Um, it, it isn't. Um, and there's a, a, a group called the Productive Seas Evidence Group, which is looking at how um, a, a voluntary, current voluntary arrangement is made um, a legal requirement of licence. But I would say that um, we, oil and gas, we have a 30-year database of benthic data for the North Sea that we publish, and it's the raw data that we publish. Okay. Move on to another... Oh, Jenny Hogan. All right, but well, you can... Just very, yeah, very okay. quick. Just to, to reiterate that as well and, and say that um, there are other projects that are being looked at, things like the Offshore Renewables Joint Industry Project. There's lots of discussions going on with Marine Scotland around ongoing monitoring for the offshore renewable sites. So that's, you know, in addition to the requirements of EIA. So there are some in initiatives already being discussed and, and taken forward there. That's useful to know. Uh, Angus MacDonald wants to kick off another question. OK, so Thanks, uh, convener. On a slightly different tack, but continuing with um, uh, management issues, as we know, the, the licensed activities or, uh, for existing operations in or near MPAs uh, can continue as they are at present. Uh, however, any new or extended operation requiring consent will have to be assessed against the conservation objectives. Uh, are panel members content uh, to see existing licence operations continue without assessing them against conservation objectives? Uh, and are there any examples of currently licensed activities that could affect the con conservation objectives? You all got that? Right, Callum Duncan, yeah. Um, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, I, I think ideally I, I would, and we've put it in our our collective link response previously would, would like to see an assessment of existing licensed activities against um, the conservation objectives for sites. Uh, and the example I gave earlier of the, the, the sewage outfall in the Merrill Bay serves in this instance as well. You know, theoretically, you have a site, 
that hasn't been legally recognised for certain types of seabed and activities have been consented that might impact that site. I, I don't have any particular ones in, in mind, but that, that point of principle stands, I think, that uh, th there should be a, a consideration of how, how those existing activities are imp impacting the features. Um, uh, I have just thought of an example. For example, the Fettler to Haraldswick site in Shetland. Uh, this is where the Atlantic and the North Sea meet. We heard that earlier. Uh, and it's uh, an absolute um, biodiverse hotspot for uh, mural beds and horse muscle beds and other biogenic features on the seabed. And there are a number of uh, fish farms there. Uh, and, but there are places in the site where... Uh, and some of those fish farms are already on top of biogenic features. So th there might be instances where it would be worth looking at whether that's appropriate or not. It's not saying there shouldn't be those f activities there. It's just to illustrate to the, the committee that, you know, potentially you've got an activity in an existing, in, in a new designation that might be having an impact on a feature that's newly legally okay. recognised. Uh, Mick. Our Boswell. stated position would be that if the evidence was sufficient to designate the site and the conservation objective is not recover, then the existing activity is not having an effect. Okay, that's um, laying down the gauntlet there. <laughs> um, if there's nobody else wants to pick up on those points, I think we'll move on to the next one, which is about fisheries and voluntary management measures. Dave Thompson. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, I was noticing from some of the information here that there are three uh, MPA voluntary measures that have been entered into by the SS SFF, the, the Creole Fishermen and the uh, Western Isles Fishermen as association, but I notice that there are other associations that aren't involved in that. Mulligan Northwest, for instance, and no doubt others, and, and uh, they relate to South Arran, West Ross, Upper Loch Fine. Um, I was just wondering how comfortable people were that um, these voluntary measures could run on for a while, um, or how quickly would people um, wish them to be uh, formalised, if you like, um, rather, rather than left as voluntary arrangements. Uh. Yeah, Ross, do you yeah, for that? Thanks, convener. Um, I think it was a case of necessity that these voluntary measures came in. As soon as the MPAs were designated, then there were certain sites within these MPAs that had to have protection and voluntary measures were the way of doing it pending the fuller discussions, which will, I can't say what the outcome of that will be, but it was a case of it had to be done straight away to protect Scottish Government, in, in effect, because I think the infraction proceedings could have taken place if it could be shown that they had not they had designated but not protected these particular features. So that's why the, the voluntary measures came in. They were discussed with... Well, Malingham Northwest, I'm surprised, but, but they were involved in the discussions as well. Uh, in terms of people who aren't signed up, it's fine for those of you who have signed up to them. The ones that haven't, how do we ensure that they don't uh, encroach and, and, and breach the, uh, the, the voluntary uh, arrangements? Um, that is a very difficult question <laughs> to which I do not have an answer. It's the, It's... Anything that's voluntary, and there are various other things which happen around the coast, you're relying on the good sense of the majority to comply. It's been portrayed as, look, this is necessary. If we don't do this, then you're looking at a big stick coming down somewhere. Mm. So we've gone along with it and recognised that it needed to be done. What the full-term measures will be, we do, nobody knows, and at that point it will be hardened up but you will always get an element of free riding, as it were, mm. on the backs of others. Mm. Mm. We've got um, Callum, Duncan, Lloyd, and then I want to come in myself, Callum. Um, I think the, the voluntary measures, uh, similar to what the shellfish, um, Shetland Shellfish Management Organisation have done for shellfish uh, there, is, you know, is, a, is a good start. Um, and it you know, illustrates um, uh, the... You know, the, um, the, the issues that will be discussed further down the line in terms of objectives, because as the committee's probably heard, we might have 
um, more ambitions for protection and recovery. That that, that said, we, we recognise these measures as a start. Um, uh, for, for the record, um, our response to what were presented as likely management options as part of the fisheries displacement study on um, eight inshore MPAs is, is, is on Marine Scotland website where we have set out the sort of measures that we think are, are needed and the voluntary measures are, uh, you know, don't go as far as that, but those discussions are still to be had. In terms of the principle of um, voluntary measures, that, uh, we think it's of benefit to to the industry and everybody concerned that when the objectives have been agreed and management required has been agreed that the the, the measures to manage fishing are statutory and we think that's to everyone's benefit because everybody knows where they stand um, it also means that if uh, if a vessel uh, flouts uh, a, a statutory closure it doesn't bring the whole industry into disrepute. Um, and I would also refer to a, a study that, that was done by um, an, uh, one of our NGO members uh, down south looking at voluntary arrangements and where these have been put in place. They haven't been very successful um, as, a, as a whole. Um, we, you know, without wishing to um, cast aspersions on on the, the fact that it's been done in the long term I think it's better for everybody that the measures become statutory um, Lloyd Austin um, yeah I'll just reiterate that I think uh, I we we warmly welcomed the voluntary measures but I think the need to follow up with the discussions on objectives and management measures is is important and the reason that needs to happen and be moved into uh, properly based um, management measures is really answered by Dave Thompson's supplementary question. Um, you know, the, those that are not signed up uh, would get caught by the statutory measures and therefore that's why we'd like to see those discussions progressed and the processes implemented. Dave Thompson. Yeah. Convener, uh, thanks for these answers. Um, of course, the, 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 the statutory thing, yeah, fine. Um, the problem then arises with all of these things, uh, and, and the convener raised this earlier about how you how you police these things, how you enforce these things, because we're in a situation where uh, public finances are being squeezed massively. There's less and less, and it could well be that that could continue over a number of years. So there's no point in having laws and protections if you can't police them. So. I was just wondering if any of the members around the table had any answers uh, to that. Callum Duncan. I think that's a really important point. Um, I mean, I think the, the ideal scenario is that, that all stakeholders recognise why measures are in place and the importance of them and, uh, and therefore wish to buy, buy, buy them. So there's, there's a culture of compliance. That's the ideal scenario. Um, and, you know, we will... Um, whilst these aren't fisheries management measures, we would hope to continue making the point of the secondary benefits that can arise from from some of these protection measures. Because you know, good examples from within the uh, the British Isles, at Lamlash Bay, Isle of Man, show where there are statutory measures. Uh, you see, thirty three zero fold increases, for example, in the Isle of Man in terms of numbers of scallops. That's a fisheries management discussion. I recognise that. We see increases in Lamlash Bay in terms of lobster size. So in terms of, we, you know, we would hope where, where those measures are needed, and we're not saying they need, they're needed everywhere, um, those are opportunities to actually test the benefits and then uh, and hopefully all local state, stakeholders see those benefits. The culture of compliance is ideal. Um, in terms of actually, uh, you know, policing it where there are, uh, floutings of the law, uh, we would like to see vessel monitoring systems on, you know, I think we should consider looking at vessel monitoring on, on, on smaller vessels uh, as well, um, because with GPS, you know, it's possible to see where, where vessel activity is happening. Um, and we saw that in relation to Lost Duoclong and Ausch recently, which highlighted some activity on, on protected features. So, 
the ideal world is cultural compliance, which you know we think is not unattainable. We, we've, we've, you see all over the world, you see fishermen fishing the line because they see the spillover effects, whether that's uh, Lee Marine Reserve in New Zealand or um, the George's Banks off northeast North America. Um, but lots of discussions and uh, studies to be done till, till we get there in Scotland. I, I want to uh, just to broaden this out a wee bit just in the same area. Uh, we can talk about the on-land uh, you know, monitoring that there should be. Now, that includes inshore fishery groups, which we haven't talked about, and their relations to the MPAs, because if they're going to work and they they're going to develop, then they have to actually be signed up to these things most of all. Because uh, I have an example a constituent gave me with regard to Fair Isle and uh, the several order there. There's a degree of um, concern not about local boats uh, flouting the rules, but boats from further afield, I'll not mention exactly where. Uh, and it comes down to the problem about whether there's onshore uh, reviews and tie-up of uh, the inshore fishery groups with the MPA development or several orders and the ships and aircraft that we have in the fishery protection squadron. So should the fishery protection squadron also be an environmental uh, pr protection squadron uh, as part of its work, so therefore need to be expanded. Ships and aircraft and so on, which the government has at its disposal, are extremely limited. Ross? Um, thanks, convener. Uh, one point I'll bring up about the voluntary measures. The voluntary measures, as well as helping Scottish government out of a hole, were brought in simply because the rush to put statutory measures in place over the past number of years has been littered with unintended consequences and once they're in it's the devil's own job to get the bad stuff out of them and that's why it was agreed to do it on a voluntary basis pending proper joined up discussion on what should be the full measures and get it right from the start instead of getting rushing something in that was going to turn out to have unintended consequences. Um, I think on the monitoring side, um, I'll quote one skipper I know who's got a smaller boat which doesn't, a, isn't big enough for the regulations under VMS and things like that. And he says, if I stand in my wheelhouse and I do that and I do that, my hands are out the window, where am I going to put this bit of kit you're wanting me to put on board? So there have been experiments done with a smaller a system called Suckerfish, but the trials have been a bit iffy, if I can put it that way. There's a lot of work being done on it. It's been trialled in the south of a southwest of England, around about Lyme Bay, I think they've tried it. But uh, so far, it's a work in progress. That's good to know. Um, Lloyd Austin and then Phil Hammond. I think the challenge of compliance is... Uh, um, an important one that we need to, to work through as part of the uh, the process. I think um, more ways of monitoring are, are desirable. But I was just going to respond to to your question, Rob, by answer, uh, indicating that actually the Fisheries Protection Agency has been renamed Marine Scotland Compliance, which indicates it's there now to ensure compliance with all of the marine regulations, irrespective of whether they're fisheries, environmental, or anything else. And so I think uh, whether they have enough resources is a question that we come back to uh, or we dealt with earlier. But I think you know they are a marine compliance agency now in the, in the round. And I think w whatever environmental training, et cetera, is needed, in much the same way as the uh, applies on land to um, wildlife and environmental police officers and uh, fiscals and so forth, more, more training and more activity is, uh, uh, on these environmental compliance issues is, is important. But the more that we could achieve what Callum called a culture of compliance, the better, so that that is a fallback uh, activity, you know, um, enforcement and prosecution is, 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 is the fallback in the occasional circumstance rather than the only way in which compliance is achieved, the better. Okay. Um, 
we've got Phil next, yes. Just following on that, just to, to note that Marine Scotland already are using their fisheries protection aircraft to survey for marine species. They've got a camera in there now which takes digital photography and they've asked us to see how that could be used to estimate the abundance of, of cetaceans. So I think that's already happening. I was wondering if uh, Mick could uh, clarify for me whether there's any uh, environmental monitoring from oil rigs at the moment. You know, um, when you talk about building up data, is there anyone actually employed in the oil industry regarding the marine environment and what you see from there? Um, short answer is no, because um, everybody on the installation has a job, <laughs> which is full time, and there aren't the beds where somebody could be standing there observing birds or cetaceans, I don't think would be the, the short answer. Okay, CCTV. Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, Ross. Well, no, yeah. just just to let you know that that the SFF have employ marine mammal observers to go and survey ships for oil and gas. Yeah, but, so we're beginning to see of uh, infrastructure being created. Uh, Callum was first, actually. Yeah, and, and just to say welcome, sort of citizen scientists across all the the sectors helping build the evidence base but I, just a very quick point which was the um, you know the sucker fish type technology is mobile phone based we know those we, we, so um, th so th that's addressing the point about the size of them but there's other technical issues there and Lloyd Austin to finish this bit I was just uh, going to comment on Mick's point that a lot of Mick's people who have jobs equally there are many good amateur naturalists amongst them who when they're off shift do make observations and input observations into particular BTO type surveys for seabirds and equally similar citizen science projects for other species so there are observations although it's admittedly off shift time and by um, you know good amateur naturalists and in the UK a huge amount of our knowledge of the natural environment is from that amateur naturalist tradition. Good, thank you. Um, we're going to try and look at um, further designations. Uh, Nigel Dawn. To look forward, we've talked about the ones that have been designated. I'm conscious, and it's already been mentioned, that there are 14 special protection areas being discussed and I think to be consulted on. Uh, and there are also four more MPAs to maybe be consulted on. I'd really be interested in, in panellists' uh, thoughts about whether they're appropriate, whether they're wanted, what they will achieve, and what timetables we might be on, please. For example, the Sea of Hebrides, North East Lewis, Southern Trench, and the Shant East Bank. Mike? Timeliness of the designations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the timeliness of the designations. Uh, my uh, IUCN task force on remote protected areas uh, started last October was specifically for increasing and facilitating and bolstering efforts for marine mammals in these types of networks. So I think that in terms of these sites being going forward and proposed, uh, I and colleagues would like to welcome those recommendations and think that it's a great leap forward for meeting those targets at the highest international levels. Um, and with respect to the sites, I think that with respect to minke whales, I think great efforts have been made going forward. Um, but I will admit, uh, in terms of colleagues, we do think that further efforts could be made with respect to additional sites for Rizzo's dolphins and a program of work for white big dolphins, a feature which wasn't identified for any sites. Okay. Um, Bob? If I could comment in the context of seabirds, um, we have a lot of SPAs with breeding seabirds as a feature of the breeding SPAs, um, but that protection doesn't cover their activities at sea when they're feeding. And I think it is crucially important that we have um, SPAs designated for seabirds at sea. One of the problems with that is identifying where they should be, because it turns out that most of our seabirds are very mobile, and they're very spread across the entire UK waters. 
So if you want to find hotspots, it's difficult to identify those hotspots because most of the North Sea, as far as seabirds is concerned, is fairly similar habitat with fairly similar feeding opportunities. So there are hotspots, but they're not very obvious, and they're only visible for some species, and it becomes quite difficult to define those. And I think that's been one of the challenges which has slowed up the process for seabirds. It's fine for inshore species like divers in coastal areas, but it's very much more difficult for pelagic seabirds, and we do have a big challenge there. And perhaps that leads on to the fact that for some of these species, the more mobile species, and it probably applies to marine mammals as well, there is a need to, to think that we need an ecosystem-based approach to conservation of those populations because site-based approaches may not be appropriate. So I think we have to be aware of the fact that there's a continuum from things like black guillemots which stay in the place all the time and an, an MPA system is, is very appropriate through to the opposite end of the spectrum where birds are travelling literally hundreds of kilometres and, and are rain, ranging over huge areas. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. It really follows on from um, Bob Furness's question about whether the um, seabird population can be protected in the way the SNH has said, and I quote, that the current work on marine SPAs is expected to complete the Scottish MPA network for seabirds and marine waterfowl. And I wonder, in view of um, Bob's remarks, how, how that could happen, if there are other comments on that. Can, okay. can I... Yep. Can I respond to that yeah, sure. uh, initially? I, I think there will be some challenges for some species where it's going to be very difficult to define sites for them. And, and so it may be completed in terms of what it's straightforward to achieve, but there may be holes and that may cause us problems. But well, with a six-yearly review, there's an opportunity to plug the hole. Can I briefly come back on that? In, in view of your remark about the um, ecosystem-based approach, how do you see that fitting in with the, um, with, with the whole picture. How, how could that be taken forward if this is going to be necessary in order to give seabirds protection? Well, we might have to think in terms of um, protecting the resources that seabirds need, in other words, food on a wider scale. And we might have to think about things like um, sand eel stocks in the whole of UK waters rather than in one specific little sandbank. Lloyd okay. Austin and then Phil Hammond. Um, yeah, thank you, Kavina. I mean, first of all, I think we do welcome the announcement of, of the new tranche of draft SPAs. It's a very good uh, step forward in terms of marine SPAs. I think it's important that we recognise that that's not actually the end. I think uh, the quote that Claudia Beamish um, referred to talked about SNH's current work, which I don't think only includes that tranche of SPAs because we're aware that there is work going on at the moment uh, uh, looking at uh, the Seabirds at Sea data that Bob and Mick referred to earlier and also new uh, data that's collected using uh, these tags, satellite tags that you put on the seabirds to identify the hotspots and w um, our understanding is that that analysis will or could will or could lead to further hotspots being identified as further SPAs. And I think that's important that that work is completed. And if it does identify more SPAs, they are added to this tranche. Because um, if, if we don't do that, we won't have a uh, coherent network of SPAs. Um, there are certainly some areas that we believe will be identified by that process that are not in this tranche that should be added. Um, I think um, in terms of Bob's comment about the ecosystem approach, I think this is a question that comes back to all the sort of widely dispersed and migratory species we were talking about, whether that be seabirds, cetaceans, sea trout and so on. I think although there needs to be ecosystem-wide uh, measures taken, uh, this, this is really about making sure that the planning, which is really the ecosystem-wide measures, and site mechanisms work hand in hand and holistically. I, I think it's important that where you can identify feeding hotspots, important places for migration or, or parts of a life cycle, you do have uh, protected area mechanisms applied to bits of these uh, migratory and mobile species. 
uh, lifestyle as part of the um, measures. So they are complementary. They're not alternatives. You need sites to deal with some of the issues and ecosystem-wide measures to deal with some of the others. So you don't, it's not an either-or. They're complementary. Um, the one question I would have on the draft SPAs is it's Scottish Government and indeed other governments in the UK and across the EU policy that what's called proposed SPAs are treated as if they are designated in relation to uh, decisions taken affecting those. Uh, that applies on land that's in Scottish planning policy, for instance. And I would welcome some clarity from the Scottish Government as to whether or not the word draft has been picked to demonstrate that they're not proposed or whether it's just a different type of wording. In other words, my question is, does the SPP policy in relation to proposed SPAs apply to these draft SPAs? We will be asking the uh, Cabinet Secretary about that next week, um, for sure. So just to wind up, Phil and Callum. Phil. Yes. So to follow on from the discussion about birds, um, marine mammals are indeed very similar to seabirds in terms of life history and, and their ecology. My view is that marine protected areas must be seen as only part of the solution for conserving and protecting marine mammals because they do range very widely. There may be some areas, and perhaps the, um, particularly the Rissa's dolphin um, uh, proposed MPA is a good one, where there's good evidence that these animals are seen there all the time and that's somewhere they like to be. Um, for other species, you know, maybe MPAs are not, not going to have that much effect. Um, marine mammals are already protected under the law. What, what I think we should think about is what are the other threats to marine mammals, and they are things like bycatching fisheries, they are things like noise, increasing noise from shipping and other disturbance. These are not threats that you're going to mitigate by having MPAs. So I think following what was said about seabirds, it has to be seen as part of the solution, but certainly by no means the, the only solution. Thank you for that. Uh, Callum Duncan. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Mike Tetley and, and Lloyd Austin have already outlined for cetaceans and, and, and seabirds why uh, you know the network's not yet complete. Uh, the SNH and JNCC advice um, uh, recognised the, the four new sites are needed, uh, but the, we don't agree with the conclusion that once there's those sites, plus some of these SPAs, uh, the network will be complete for the reasons we've heard about cetaceans and, and, and seabirds, but also basking sharks and others, but also because of um, inherent points made in the advice. Uh, the, 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 the report to Marine Scotland overtly recognised that there were gaps in duplication. A coherent network needs to protect uh, enough of the populations and extents of uh, the range of species and habitats and has to have replication to, um, uh, uh, to, to increase resilience. And there's only one site for common skate. There's recognition that that needs duplicated. There's only going to be one site for basking shark. There's only going to be one site for white beak dolphin. So within the advice, that lack of duplication is recognised. I also touched on earlier that um, the spiny lobster, heart cockle aggregations and burrowing and enemies are recognised as features that would benefit from area-based protection. And just because suitable areas haven't been found for them doesn't make them any less uh, um, important to, to get protection. And then the last point is the, they've stated that further research is needed to improve connectivity between sites. So further research uh, could be showing that some of the sites aren't close enough together and we need new sites to, to get that connectivity. Yes, I thank you for that. Um, and uh, Mike Tetley. Yes, on to, to comments, just, just quickly, it was a one site for Rizzo's dolphin, just, just, just for record, uh, not white beak dolphin. But also to follow up on um, f uh, Phil Hammond's comments, uh, I totally agree. I think that uh, spatial measures for conservation of cetaceans and marine mammals and mobile species require a holistic and well thought out management which encourages both sectoral management and also site based protection measures. So I totally agree with that. I also agree that in some cases single MPAs with respect to achieving conservation objectives for a species of marine mammal in some times are not appropriate. But the consideration of those mobile species and MPAs within a network 
to address those different areas of critical habitat where identifiable do and have been proven to work successfully for the conservation and conservation benefit of those species of mobile species and the ecosystem services that they generate. So, thank you. Everybody for uh, the contributions that you've made. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, we're going to be questioning the Cabinet Secretary about these matters, about the way we designate, about the way we police, the way that we fund. Uh, we will be very uh, searching of him to find out just exactly what he thinks the current state of play is and to explore uh, the the, the evidence you provided us with uh, in the context of the government actually carrying it out. So we look forward to that. And I'd like to thank you all. Extremely uh, even-tempered and uh, incisive in quite a number of ways uh, for your contribution this afternoon as it is now. And I want to bring this uh, meeting to a formal close by saying that we'll be starting at 9.30 with the formal meeting next week. And indeed, we'll be dealing with the agricultural holdings legislation review with the Cabinet Secretary and with the, the Scottish Government's designation of marine protected areas. So with that, I close the meeting and thank you for your attendance.